Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank the Lord that we're all here. And uh, I'd like to share today out of the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. So I'll give you all a second to get there. Uh, just uh, thankful for all the people, uh, especially Pastor John's health, and Pastor Ballou, and we just uh, pray for Pastor Jim again. Just lift him up this morning. So, chapter 19 of Acts, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, What then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. And they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. Thus concludes today's reading. Good morning. Welcome to the Course Community Bible Church. Today, we're going to be looking at the subject, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? So we're going to spend some time in the book of Acts and, uh, of course, going through the other scriptures throughout the Bible for this subject, but we'd like to begin in a word of prayer if we could bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And in the Old Testament, uh, the writer proclaims the same... Uh, feelings that the Church of Jesus Christ feels. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go in the house of the Lord where two or three are gathered together and in your name you are present. And so we pray that you will receive our praises, our worship this day, and that your spirit might speak now through your word to encourage our hearts. We love you, praise you, ask for forgiveness of our shortcomings of my sins. Thank you, Jesus. And now bless your word as it goes forward in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the subject today is, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Somebody said, Pastor, what? Well, we haven't talked about this that often. It has been talked about. It's basically understood. Uh, but I think that it's important that we cover this subject, obviously, because... The Holy Spirit is the third person of the divine being of God, the triune divine being of God. And we might ask that same question, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And you're, some that are listening in would be a little perplexed. Okay, and so we're going to define our terms uh, quickly. But there are those that don't uh, understand about the Holy Spirit and the triune being of God and the role of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is part and parcel of the package that comes at salvation. And the passage that was just read uh, uh, might seem to differ with that statement, but it doesn't. When Paul here in the book of Acts chapter 19 verses 1 through 7 was asking that question, it was because there was a transition period taking place. Is that important to know? Absolutely. The transition that was taking place was from the old covenant to the new. When did the church begin? Did it begin when Christ rose from the dead at the cross? Or did it begin at Pentecost? Officially, it began at Pentecost. And Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 tells us that, well, the 
people that were gathered in the upper room, 120 of them, the disciples, Mary and, and others, they were told to wait until the Holy Spirit would come. And, and when the Holy Spirit came, he filled them, the believers. So let, let's use a couple of terms here. <clears throat> In this context, the filling and the uh, indwelling, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is the same thing. Filling, indwelling, baptism. In this context, the filling here includes being baptized in the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in this context. When we go back to Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Holy Spirit, when that's talking to the believer there, that usage of the word filled means something different. And how do we know that? By the other scriptures that we're going to go through. But in Ephesians 5.18, it says, be filled, be not drunk with wine, which is in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. What do you mean be filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm already saved. Well, at the moment of salvation, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Now, I'm going to have to backtrack in these verses that we've just uh, uh, mentioned, and that's in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, but let me give you 1 Corinthians 12, 13 first. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 was given now to the established Gentile church. That verse is not only for the church at Corinth, it's but for all the churches that were in existence in that day because the churches that received these letters would pass them on to the different churches and that became of course our New Testament uh, uh, canon. And so in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 it says what? No, you, or no, I always do that. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13 it says that uh, uh, for by one spirit it says, are we all, and that word are is in the aorist tense, which means it began in the past, in a moment in the past, but continues through. So keep that in mind. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Uh, now that word baptized. That word baptized means uh, immersed, bapto, baptizo. It means immerse, the same as water baptism, and that's important to know. Baptizo is a, baptize is a transliteration from the Old Testament Greek, uh, baptize from the word uh, baptizo or bapto. And it means to be immersed into something, and that's the same as water. Water baptism is the picture of Holy Spirit baptism. And water baptism is the picture of uh, being placed into the body of Christ. Uh, his death, his burial, and his resurrection as water baptism, but it's Holy Spirit baptism. Holy Spirit baptism is the operation that takes place, spiritual operation that takes place the moment of salvation. The Holy Spirit places us into the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ spiritually, and we are born again. We are placed into the body of Christ. And it says, for by one Spirit are we all, how many? Those who have waited for the second blessing or those who have just received Christ but you don't have the Holy Spirit? No, all believers are baptized or placed into the body of Christ the moment that they're saved. There is some confusion today in different denominations. We'll cover some of the points. It's important that we listen. But it's pretty clear. Remember, we're talking about a transition here. We're going from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. We're going to talk about how the, the Old Covenant, no one was baptized in the Holy Spirit. No one was placed in the body of Christ in the Old Testament. Yes, they were saved. The Holy Spirit did transform their hearts by faith, by grace through faith. We always have to understand this. How is a person saved in the Old Testament and the New Testament the same way? By grace through faith. It's God's gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. But at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit places us into the body of Christ. And I want to give you some verses on that. And by the way, this is permanent. Uh, we cannot lose the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and He indwells inside the believer's heart. And He doesn't leave. In the Old Testament, we'll give you just a couple verses, not now, but in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people to enable them to perform certain uh, things, physical things and spiritual things. 
But in the New Testament, we're baptized into the body of Christ, and he never leaves us. And where does it say that? Ephesians 4 and verse 30. Ephesians 4 and verse 30. What does it say? Listen to this. Grieve not the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed. How long? Until the day of redemption. What is the day of redemption? Rapture. I'm going to say that one more time. Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit by whom you are what? Sealed until the day of redemption. If you have the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit has you, if the Holy Spirit is in you, if you're a true believer, you have the Holy Spirit. And you're sealed until the day of redemption. When, it, when does God come and redeem us? The rapture. Okay? And uh, so uh, we are sealed. Now, Romans chapter 8, verses 9 and 11. But Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. This is important. That's why we look to what? The Word of God. So this one is said. Romans 8 and 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's, he's, he's not his. The Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit here. The Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. We'll find this mentioned in different parts of the, uh, uh, of the Bible. But when it says the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God is speaking about the Holy Spirit. Does he, the Bible use the, the term Holy Spirit in it? Yes, many times. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. Do you have the Spirit of Christ? Do you have the Holy Spirit? If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not his. You're not Christ. Romans 8 and 9, and then verse 11. Romans 8 and verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him, that's God the Father, if the Spirit of Him, so we're speaking now not only about the Spirit of Christ, we're speaking about the Spirit of God the Father here. If the Spirit of Him, God, that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Quicken means make alive your mortal bodies. And so, how are we going to be transformed? It's by the work of the Holy Spirit. Including our mortal bodies. And when is that? That's when we are glorified. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven. For once also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall transform, who shall change our vile bodies, our mortal bodies, and fashion them like unto his own glorious body, according to the working whereby he's able to subdue even all things unto himself, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. And he, quick, he quickens our bodies. Okay. Um, here's a verse for you. 1 Corinthians 3.16. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Listen carefully. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now he's speaking here, Paul the Apostle, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he's writing these scriptures, that Every believer at the church of Corinth, without exception, had received the Holy Spirit the moment that they were saved. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? He didn't say those of you that have gotten the second blessing. By the way, there's more than a second blessing. There's like, I don't know, I'm on my uh, about 11,577th <laughs> blessing. It's crazy. I don't know about you. <laughs> and I thank the Lord. Uh, know you not that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Don't you know that? Now what about our title today, Have You Received the Holy Spirit Since You Believed? And Paul was speaking to the disciples of John the Baptist. Were they Christians? Not completed Christians. John the Baptist's uh, uh, disciples were not completed Christians. They were believers in Christ. But they hadn't been placed into Christ's body. They were still under the old covenant. If they had died, they'd have gone to be with the Lord. They were, they were saved, but they weren't completed Christians. How about that one? That's, that's where the confusion comes to a lot of people. There was a transitioning from the old covenant to the new covenant, and that's why Acts 1.8, and you want to write that down. You know, if you're writing these verses down, you'll be... You'll understand it. Uh, genuinely understand it. Acts 1 8. 
And what, what the Lord tells us in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 under the writing of uh, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, it says, and you shall receive power. It's the same power that is spoken of in John chapter 1 and verse 12. To as many as received him, to them gave he the power. Dunamites, to become the sons of God, even then that believe, not work, not labor, not uh, do some uh, you know, special things. No. To them that believe, to receive Christ, those that receive Christ, into their hearts, it says, you shall receive power after that the Spirit of God comes upon you. And uh, that's uh, John 1, 12. But also in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. So it's not th this, these truths and this principle concerning the uh, Holy Spirit is not based on one or two or three or four. I mean, it's based on several passages, many, and we can't go over them all. But the church has the Holy Spirit which places us into the body of Christ. And that's what makes us the completed Christian. Now, listen. Uh, let me give you 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 21st. What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have of God? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God who is in you, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. I think that's enough for me. I'm just glad that I have the Holy Spirit. Now somebody's going to say, yeah, but I don't feel. Listen, the Holy Spirit is in another dimension. This We're living in a physical dimension. Boy, if the Holy Spirit was physical, boy, we'd be feeling them all the time. Oh, I know right where he's at. It's a spiritual dimension. Now that doesn't mean that our emotions cannot be involved. They may or they may not be involved. There are some times that we quench the Holy Spirit. You know when that happens? There's a person that is over here and somebody's been praying. Listen to this. Somebody's been praying for this person to be saved. And God says, you know, well... Who am I going to get to talk to this person? Because God doesn't open the sky and uh, uh, start uh, thunder and light up the sky. Not usually. He could. He will in the book of Revelation through the angel with the everlasting gospel. But most often he'll take one of you if you're a yielded believer to go. And he'll put it on your heart. And you'll go over and you've got what? In your pocket. Because we're living in the 21st century. Of course we've got, got one of these in our pockets. Because we don't know that we're only going to have one or two minutes with somebody. Is somebody going to get saved in one or two minutes worth of planting seeds? Mm, I don't know. But uh, you're planting the seed. You take him one of these. I don't mean this one particularly. But you keep something on you. And then when you run out and there are more opportunities and God is leading you and you're, you're grieved because you don't have this, do something. Talk to them. Spend some time like my brother Paul did. <laughs> he talked to everybody. Um, and at that moment or what have you, the Holy Spirit takes over because he's using the Word of God, Romans 10, 14. Romans 10, 14. How can they hear unless somebody be sent? How can somebody... God, unless they hear the word of God and how can they hear it unless somebody be sent and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God so um, don't quench the Holy Spirit he's telling you go and share and you know that you need to be shared maybe it's uh, somebody that's called you on the phone or maybe it's somebody that God has put on your heart and you're supposed to call them or maybe isn't this something you're supposed to call them but they call you and you're thinking wow you know, I was just thinking about you. Has that ever happened? Boy, that has happened. God wants you to talk to that person. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Grieve not the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed of God. Listen, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we sin. You mean a, a Christian can sin? Yeah. But when we sin, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. 
We're grieving the Father, we're grieving the Son, and we're grieving the Holy Spirit. But wait a minute, the Holy Spirit's living inside. You know, when you're going to that movie theater, maybe you don't know what you're about to see. Maybe you have an inkling that there's going to be uh, bad language or the Lord's name taken in vain or that there's going to be some uh, sexual indiscretion. And you go on in there and you're sitting there with all the other worldly people who are just taking it in, just and gargling with it. And you're sitting there. Guess who's sitting there inside you? Always remember this. The Holy Spirit. You think the Holy Spirit wants to be there in you watching that movie or listening to that music or going to that party where there's all this conversation that is filth and the dirty jokes and the so forth and what have you. Sometimes you have to put up with it at work, don't you? But not voluntarily, not willingly. The Bible says evil company corrupts good morals and so we need to teach our children, don't we? Okay, and we can't teach them by the company that we keep if we're keeping company with the world. So, uh, the Holy Spirit is grieved. When you're thinking those thoughts, when you're looking at that magazine and perchance it was Sports Illustrated, but you hit the wrong page. What do you mean you don't know what I'm talking about, Pastor? <laughs> I'm looking at the men. Sometimes Sports Illustrated is uh, puts these... Uh, uh, scantily uh, dressed uh, young ladies with the purpose to allure us to buy more magazines. Okay, that's just uh, uh, a fact of life. And in Proverbs chapter 6 and Ch Proverbs chapter 7, what does it tell us to do? It tells us get out of there. And what does the New Testament? Flee fornication. And if we don't, who are we grieving? The Holy Spirit who's where? Right looking through our eyes. Right thinking through our mind. Who is in our heart. It's the Holy Spirit. And I'll say that verse again, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. It says, what, don't you know? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have of God? You are not your own. You're bought with the price. What was the price? The blood of Jesus. I don't, there is no multi-billionaire. There is no future trillionaire that would have enough to pay for a drop of the blood of Jesus, but he shed all of it for you and me. And whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. And so, let us not take the Holy Spirit to places. Let us flee those places. Let us use our mind. Paul, he says, with the mind I serve the law of God. Set your mind on things that are above. Let not sin therefore rule in your mortal Bodies that you should obey, it and its lust thereof, neither yield ye your members, your eyes, your nose, your toes, your legs, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield your, yourselves unto God, right of way, yield sign. You have that ability. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, Romans 6, 11 through 13. Romans 6, 11 through 13. And so that is the walk and the talk. That's the being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why in the morning when you wake up and there's possibly some thoughts that shouldn't be there that you ask God, help me through this, that I can cast this imagination out and confess it and be filled with the Holy Spirit. There it is. We'll be talking about this in the future as far as uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Today we're talking about, do you have them? Yes. If you don't have, listen, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you better check and examine yourself whether you're saved. And if you don't have the chastisement of God, if you step out of His will, then you better really check whether you're saved. Make sure you're calling an election, Peter says. So, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, in whom ye also trusted, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, so this is the person, if you trusted Christ, you heard the word of truth. And the gospel of your salvation, you heard the gospel that saved you, in whom 
also after you believe. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that's Ephesians 1 and verse 13. The Holy Spirit of promise. What do you mean the Holy Spirit of promise? The Holy Spirit was promised. Where was He promised? He was promised by Jesus Christ. You remember? Jesus Christ in the Gospel of uh, John in uh, chapter 7, He had promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now up to that point, wasn't the Holy Spirit there? Yeah. The Holy Spirit was there. He was uh, saving people. He was bringing conviction. He was uh, sent into the world to reprove the world of sin, of judgment, of righteousness. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But He didn't come and dwell inside of believers in the Old Testament. But that's what Jesus was promising. John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Boy, that sounds like a strange invitation because they're at a feast. <laughs> Unless he's standing next to the uh, punch table. But he's telling everybody, Anybody thirsty, come unto me. And I will give you water. But it wasn't strange. It wasn't unusual because he had a, a spiritual message that he wanted to uh, share with everyone that was there. Let him come unto me and drink because he that believes on me as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this he spoke of what? The Holy Spirit. The water of life. The flowing waters. The water that we need to be born again. What are the verses? John 7, 37 through 39. And so he says, I am sending the Holy Spirit if you believe on me. I'll send him inside of you and you will never thirst. Meaning this, is that you never have to uh, search for the fountain to find the water. You never have to go thirsty. You never have to go thirsty. It's our fault if we're going thirsty. Because He's there and doesn't leave us. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So, that is the Holy Spirit who was given when at Pentecost. Okay, now, briefly I'd like to go through these things so that we can understand when we're looking here at the message today. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? That's not, Paul wasn't speaking to the church, friends. He was speaking to the uh, Jewish believers that hadn't come to Christ yet and received the Holy Spirit to be placed into Christ's body. They hadn't, that hadn't been done yet. And that's why they said, well, the Holy Spirit, we didn't even know what a... We haven't heard of the Holy Spirit. And so what did Paul do who had equal right because he was appointed by the Father unto the Gentiles to take the keys that God had given to Peter to the authority of the apostles. And by the way, it wasn't just Peter. It was Peter, James, and John. Because uh, they came with uh, Peter in Acts chapter 8 to the Samaritans to open the door of the gospel. And so they were with them. They had authority too. And the apostles and says in other places as well, they had the authority. And by the way, in a sense, you and I have the authority for children of God. Meaning that we can open the gospel to someone who is lost, who is blind, who is dead. How? With the Word of God. With the Word of God. And in that case, since it was introductory, since it was new, since it was fulfilling Acts 1 and verse 8, it was filling the part of the transition period. Uh, it was something that was uh, significant. And that was when they would lay hands on the persons. That was their authority. They would lay hands on the person to receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, let's give you Acts 1.8. Uh, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. There is a... Uh, there's an order... Jerusalem and Judea. Why is it them first? It's because the message has to go to the Jews first. First of all, who did Peter speak to in Acts chapter 2? 
to the Jews in Jerusalem, how many got saved? 3,000 of them. Were there any Gentiles? No. To the Jews first. And so it says to Judea and uh, Jerusalem that it says, then to Samaria. And why was Samaria uh, 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 different than the Gentiles? They were considered dogs. Half-breeds. They were dogs. The Gentiles were considered dogs. The Samaritans were considered dogs. Why? Because they were half-breeds. They had uh, half Gentile and half Jewish heritage. They had to go away from the Jewish community because, listen to this, does this make sense to you? God had told the Jewish people, I only want you to uh, marry Jewish believers. What? They got to be Jewish? Yeah. Now what happened if somebody was outside of the Jewish family and uh, they wanted to marry them? If that person was genuine and a believer, they were uh, proselyted. They had to go through uh, a, uh, the, the Jewish um, ceremony in order to become uh, a, uh, a Jewish believer. And that included circumcision. So, anyways, the same is for the church. Be not unequally yoked. The church is not supposed to marry anyone who is not a blood-bought, born-again believer and has a spiritual desire to live for the kingdom. No business marrying anyone that doesn't have that heart for God. You can't go to some of these churches or the world and uh, say something like this. As, uh, oh, she goes to church. Oh, this guy's a Sunday school teacher. That doesn't make him a believer. If, you know what we do in our church? And I, uh, I'm going to have to close right here because of the time. Maybe I'll pick up next week. Because, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about the responsibility of the church to the body of Christ. Imagine that. Does the church, do I have a, a responsibility to the body of Christ? Are you a part of it? Do you want to be uh, ministered to the way that God had designed then you too also have been re given gifts in order that you can minister to the body of Christ and that does not mean the world. Yeah, we reach out to the world. Yes, we build uh, wells to those that are thirsty. Yes, we send food. Yes, we send money to the things of the world so that they can see the love of Christ. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples by your love. By your love. But we have to be careful here because in the body of Christ, God has called us. And so the question is, and what we just said, was that with regards to whom we marry and whom we fellowship with and whom we grow together with, it's the body of Christ. Of Christ. Okay? All right, we'll talk about that uh, as we go on. And, and, I, and, and, and I'm going to have to uh, close there right now uh, just for the meantime until maybe next time. But um, do we see how important that the Holy Spirit is? If, 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 two reasons, if two things, if you are not convicted by the Holy Spirit, you better start examining your heart, am I a Christian? When you go out and you do this, when you are over here and God has, is there any type of conviction to share, to witness? Is there anything to, that He prompts you? And if there isn't, oh my goodness, maybe you don't have the Holy Spirit, but you're not a Christian. You're a professing Christian, maybe. And and but in the in, in the body of Christ, it's a small group, friends. Remember the gate is wide that leads to destruction, and many there be that find that. The gate to what they believe happened, the gate. But the but the but the little uh, kind of like at the turnstile at a movie theater that only one at a time. And that's exactly how it is, how you get to heaven one at a time. He's not bringing groups through. He's bringing one at a time. He says the gate that leads to eternal life is narrow. It's small and few there be that find it. Are you a part of the few? Because if you are, then the Holy Spirit is inside of you. There's the convicting work. 
there's the demonstration of the lifestyle and uh, there's the desire and the passion and that's it so if you're a believer yes you do have the Holy Spirit you don't have to ask this question and we'll talk a little bit more about that next time our father um, I can't locate some, that part of my heart or that part of my brain but father I believe it and I also know it and same with you because I know you're in my heart and I'm grateful, Father. And today we're speaking about uh, our beloved uh, uh, Holy Spirit that has come and lived in our hearts and lives in our hearts. And Father, we pray for the rest of those that are... And uh, I just want to say this, and we know it. We can't live through a part of a day without understanding and knowing that the Holy Spirit's there. It just can't happen. Let alone a whole day or a week or a a month, a year, or a lifetime. So, thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing that conviction for salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, shedding your precious blood for our sins, rising again from the dead. Holy Spirit, we couldn't have known that apart from the convicting work of the Holy Spirit that enlightened us, that brought us to repentance. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Couldn't have been saved except the work of the Holy Spirit to reprove, to convict in my heart, in our hearts, in our lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for taking us and placing us into the body of Christ by faith in Jesus Christ alone. By your grace, Heavenly Father, we bow before you, we praise you, we thank you, we adore you, we love you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.